All right, so I'll just wait till I see your hand go up and I'll say hi, everybody. Hi, welcome. Hey, uh, I'm glad you're here. Why is it important what we're talking about here today? Because we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And what God describes in this text is this idea of a veil. And how when people look to Jesus, there's a veil. Something is, un, uh, is removed. That we cannot see everything in life, but God wants to unveil our minds through what Jesus Christ has done. So we're going to take a look at all this. And uh, so I'm glad that you're here. Stay with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. I got some pictures here of Spain. Uh, this is a shot of me with my sunglasses on and my wife, Kim. And we're in a town called Cotillo, okay? And um, here's a shot of us by the beach. It looks like a little rocky area before the beach. And uh, the small town is behind us. But what we did, we went to the Canary Islands, okay? And in the Canary Islands, we, we wanted to go see a little town because we were in this resort where everything was done for you. They had the beach there, the pool there. And I thought, well, I want to go out and see the a little bit. So, so why don't you try to go to this little town, they said at the reception desk. We get to this town, and the, and, and the cab driver drops us off on the beach. He says, you can walk to the town from here, and which we did, and it was nice. We got to see more of the island. But I started to get real and happy because we could not find how to get back. The cab driver was saying, well, call me. I'll be here in 20 minutes. And people are saying, no, no, no. You don't want to call from... Cortina, the other town we were at, I think that's how it's pronounced, to come and get you and drive all the way. They won't drive. It'll take a long time. It'll cost you a fortune. But what they did at this hotel is they gave us a copy of the bus schedule. And they said, you just get on bus number eight. We couldn't find the bus stop. And I'm thinking, man, we're stuck in this place and we're asking all these people in Spanish, you know, where is the bus stop? And I'm going, oh my gosh, why did I choose this? Where is that bus stop? Well, eventually we found the bus stop, and then the insecurity finally went away when bus number eight showed up and we got back. I thought, man, what a bad decision. And especially at the time, it was the worst part of the whole uh, trip was that insecurity of not being able to see, find that bus station. Well, After I got back, I thought, that was the worst experience, but I'd do it again. Why? Because we know where the bus stop is. <laughs> and we had the whole schedule here. And uh, people were telling us, oh, it takes a long time to get to the main town there on the Canary Islands, but I don't care. As long as we get there and I feel secure, got our room and everything and our place to eat and what we needed. But I'd, I'd go again because now we know where it's at. You know... God wants to show us where our life is at. And much more than getting, say, lost in a town and none of, not knowing how we're going to get back, God speaks of this veil. And there's a veil that is over us that we cannot see certain things in our life. But when we look to Jesus, the veil is removed. So we want to look at, well, what does he say about the veil? The veil happens through the law of God. And it is the law of God that keeps our minds veiled. Okay? Now we might say, whoa, that sounds like, uh, well, it doesn't make sense. If God wants to unveil us and show us the truth, well, why is he giving us the law? And I think that the law makes sense to us as human beings. Uh, it says, but their minds were hardened, for to this day when the... They read the old covenant that the same veil remains uplifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Our minds can be hardened by the law. Because I think it's just the way that we were made and created by God. We were created for doing good. If you want your life to work, do things. Do good things, not bad things. The idea that says our life comes down to what we do is a powerful thing. And what God has basically done with the Ten Commandments, he said, here you go. 
And we say, okay, that's what I need to do. And, you know, you could even get the cliff notes on them, which is basically comes down to they all reduce themselves to love God and love other people. i got to love people. And we can even throw Jesus in there. Veil Jesus, or the, with the veil over our veins. Jesus is our example. He tells us how to live and how to be good per- people. And you know, every day of your life, you should try maybe to strive to be a little better the next day. And we see with human works, they do get results. If I take my hands right now and I say, I want to take this candle and move it to another angle that may be better, I could easily do that. There it is. You know, if you say, well, do you want to retire comfortably? I would say, yes, at a young age, as soon as you start working, don't spend all your money. Save some of your money, invest some of your money into assets, and you're probably going to be okay because of what you do. If you're going to be a good person, do good things in society. Don't be a liability to society. That's why we have prisons. And you stay out of prison by doing good. That's all veiled living. Jesus is our lawgiver. Jesus is our example. Believing in God is what good people do because they know um, it's all about do, do, do. Because that's the way we're made. Now, this week, we are uh, looking at Transfiguration Sunday. And then the church, if you're not familiar with Transfiguration Sunday, it comes from a gospel reading there. Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, takes them up to a mountain, and the whole mountain lights up. And that Jesus is unveiled in front of them, and the light is, in his, is bright, his garments are bleached, Elijah shows up, Moses shows up, they know who he is, and what does Peter do? Do, do, do. I gotta build booths. I gotta build the tents and the skinnies to mark this place. And he's scared, but he doesn't know what to do, but he does it anyway. God says, Stop it, Peter. Listen to Jesus. Your life is not about what you do. And here's the rules that you need to do. Your life will be about what has been done for you. That's turning to Jesus. And that's where there is this veil that gets removed. Now, I'm just going to hold on a bit here and cheat, take us down the road. Of the text, this happens only by the power of the Holy Spirit that God will reveal the veil to you. But when we look to Jesus, we're looking in the right place. When, if Peter listens to Jesus up there on the mountain, when God, or listens to God up on that mountain, look to Jesus, he's getting it right. Because it's not going to be about what we do. Turning to Jesus unveils our minds. So here's the but. And verse 16, some of you may know the rule if you're good at English, or maybe if you're not. The word but erases everything before that. And the main thing it's erasing in the text here is the law of Moses. Jesus is going to erase the law of Moses by fulfilling the laws of Moses for us. So, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The mystery of life comes, not through what we do, it's through what Jesus does for us. Now, it is important what we do. And the strangeness of Christianity is, it is what we do that gets us in towards God, and what we do is foul up. God says, here's the two marks of life in the law of Moses, love God, love other people. And when we fail, when we stop saying, hey, it doesn't work any my, uh, more in my life. I can't rate myself to others. I'm just not happy. I'm a failure. That's not a bad thing. Because God wants to love us as we turn to Jesus. The veil gets removed. And when the veil gets removed, we understand what Jesus has done for us. That we are freed by his grace. That he is the one who loves us. 
and sets us free. And it is the Spirit that is given to us as it is revealed as we look to Jesus and the Spirit gives us freedom. And freedom from what? Freedom from the pressure of your human performance, of measuring up to the rules of God, measuring up to the rules of people in your culture, in your society. Then you're set free. And that's freedom. It's a thanks be to God moment. The veil has been removed. Christ has fulfilled all things for me. I am loved and forgiven. Despite the fact of what I do, it's not about what I do. It's about what Christ has done for me. With his grace, with his love, and with his mercy. And it is this unveiling of our minds and our hearts that leads to life transformation. So unveiling our minds leads to our transformation. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of the one degree of glory to another. For this comes the Lord from the Lord, who is a spirit. So God reveals himself to us, reveals what he's done, that becomes our life, and it is that knowledge of understanding in our hearts and in our minds that will change our life. This is what we call sanctification. So this idea of being transformed, and maybe some of you who know the word in English called metamorphosis, it's the same word that's used in the Greek text here. And in the church, we call this basically sanctification. Or as I like to put it in its more understandable place where it belongs in all of life, is God changes your life. He changes your life through what Jesus has done for you. To say we become a new creation in Christ that says, I want to live a life of responding to what God has done for me. God, what do you want from me? Then I go back to the law not to get something, but to be who I am, to understand who I am. Christianity becomes a response to the grace of God where we get empowered to love God and to love other people. We are given his grace and empowered by his grace to live the life he calls. This all happens through the unveiling of our minds and our hearts looking to Jesus because that's where it's at. It's in what Jesus Christ has done for us that sets us free to be the people of God. Taking the pressure off to live a life, a good life, a transformed life by the grace of God. God unveils himself to us. Amen. Well, let's go to the prayers. And we'll pray for God's transformation in our life, the unveiling of who he is. Uh, Pray that people will turn to him. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here. And we hear about an unveiling in the text today. Father, we ask that you would unveil us constantly to show us Jesus as we turn to him, not to ourselves, Not to the law of Moses that we believe will make us righteous by being good people, but turning to Jesus who has fulfilled all things for us. Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, transform us and change us to be your people. And Heavenly Father, when we are frustrated seeing our sin, seeing where we fall short of your glory, bring us back to the unveiling of our minds to Jesus once again to say, thank you, God for what you've done. And Heavenly Father, you do call us to love others. So as a response to your grace, we bring before you countries in conflict uh, throughout the world. We think of Hamas and the Israelis, and we think of those who are suffering throughout that region. We ask for peace. Peace that the Israelis would live in security. Peace that the Palestinians would live in security and that their needs would be met. And um, they would be able to live side by side in peace, as well as the Russians, the Ukrainians. Send peace into this world, Heavenly Father. We ask as your dear children. Uh, We think of Mary, who's asking for uh, prayers for pain um, and for migraines and a bulging disc 
be close to Mary, draw close to her. For Carolyn, whose daughter is struggling with alcoholism and mental disorders, watch over her, take care of her, bring resolution to her life. And for the prayer prompt that has gone out to pray for all of those who need a support in their relationships. Father, we know whether we're connecting to you or not, relationships are key and important. And you even say they are in your Ten Commandments. Father, give people what they need for the support to have good relationships. For Dina Villavincencio, who says with cancer, and Charlotte Tucker recovering after knee surgery, Sherry Bradley, who has a brain tumor, Betty Ledbetter, who is recovering from back surgery, and Karen Manzel, we thank you for her successful procedure and for all of our online community and those who have called out to our prayer partners. So into your hands do we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Amen. Okay. We have a life, a life to live. I encourage you, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 has said, look to Jesus Christ, not to yourself, not to your own good works. It is Jesus Christ that God has brought to prove you as a loved and accepted person. It is Jesus Christ who brings us back to the family of God. Continue to look and allow God and the Holy Spirit to unveil you, allow God to transform your life. And on your life journey, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor, give you and your life his peace. Thank you for being here with us today. I hope you can check us out on our website. Maybe you're on it right now. Um, or come and see us on Sunday. If you would like to put in a prayer requests for our prayer partners, we'd certainly uh, take that. And if you'd like to be a part of our prayer partners, I think we have like, what, maybe 3,000 throughout the world now. Uh, there's room for you too, uh, to pray for people, to love people, and to bring their needs before God. Anyway, God's peace. Thank you for being here. Take care. Come back again. go.